Hi, uh, hello. I'm Bill Novick. I'm a pediatric cardiac surgeon here at the University of Tennessee Health Science Center. I'm the Paul Nehmer Professor of International Child Health and Surgery. And my duties here at the university are to develop sustainable pediatric cardiac care programs in low and middle income countries. I've been doing this since 1993, and I've been doing it full time as the Professor of International Child Health since 2001. The mission trips part of our program is supported by a 501c3 charity called the William Novick Global Cardiac Alliance. And the goal of that alliance is to build capacity and hopefully sustainability in low and middle income countries for their pediatric cardiac care. Since 1993, our teams have operated on five continents in over 30 countries more than 50 institutions. We have provided surgery to nearly 10,000 children to date. Typically, we make somewhere between 22 to 25 trips a year. And we will operate on anywhere from 300 to 450 children. You know, NCA provides a complete team of pediatric cardiac specialists to the sites needing assistance. Our trips vary in length from two to four weeks, depending upon local infrastructure and the desire of the particular institution we're working in. We work side by side with each of our local colleagues in all phases of the care of these children. Our work is principled upon the idea of mentorship leading to graduated responsibility for the local caregivers. We don't always work in safe places around the world. We work in a multitude of conflict zones. We work across the conflict zones between Russia and Ukraine. We work across the sectarian conflict zone in Iraq between Shias and Sunnis. We work in Pakistan where you never know whether or not Al-Qaeda or ISIS are going to be problematic. And we also work in Libya, which right now is in a major conflict with itself. You know, when you're working in a conflict zone, there are always challenges that are a little bit different than just working in an LMIC. You know, when we were working in Tobruk, we were told that we were on ISIS's hit list because they had found out that some of the children that we'd operated on in the towns that they'd occupied had come back to those towns and told them, well, there's an American team operating in Tobruk. We've been in Tripoli since November of last year, following uh, General Hafta's attack. Uh, I mean, our team was literally in country while he was bombing the suburbs of Libya. So there are some very unique challenges associated with operating in conflict zones. One of the things that you have to keep in mind is that you have to have an exit strategy for your team. The safety of the team is paramount. And the ministries of the interior for both sides of the country are always with us and will let us know when they're ready for us to be evacuated. Medical diplomacy is about outside stakeholders bringing medical equipment, supplies, medications, and expertise to assist that particular country in solving a healthcare problem and focusing the country's decision makers on the policy changes that need to be made in order to create a more sustainable solution for the particular healthcare problem that you're helping with. You're actually working as a diplomat. In March of this year, after having witnessed war on both sides of the countries for so long, I submitted an editorial to the two leaders of Libya, General Hafta in the East and President Siraj in the West. As a doctor, humanitarian, father, an individual who sees the vast potential for Libya, I beseech you, General Hafta and President Siraj, to find a solution to this conflict so that the children of Libya will have a future. We have successfully changed the policy towards pediatric heart disease on both sides of the political divide in Libya. One of the most unique aspects of our program in Libya is that we are training more women than men 
to become pediatric cardiac surgeons. The ratio is five to three currently. Our senior trainees on both sides are women. In the East, we have Dr. Wishdan Abu Amir. She's a very interesting woman. She actually is born from Palestinian parents who immigrated to Libya years ago. As a consequence of that, she's actually seen as a non-Libyan. This is truly a remarkable individual. In the West, we have Dr. Fatima. She's a Libyan by birth. She's taken on a leadership role of our program uh, in Tripoli as we stand has taken on the leadership role of our programs in the East. You know, pretty much like any typical day on any mission trip that any of you have ever made, uh, we get up and we have breakfast as a team and uh, we leave the hotel uh, in a minibus, take the minibus uh, to the hospital. We arrive at the hospital and the first thing that we do together is that we make ICU rounds. Now, this is a multidisciplinary round powered by our nurses. We're very much a nurse empowerment group. And so we have the nurses lead the discussion of the patients with input from the intensivists, from input from the surgeons. Following that, we break up into our groups. So we have the anesthesia team and the scrub nurse and the perfusionist, they go to the operating room. The intensive care team obviously stays in the ICU and the surgeons then typically depart for the echo lab to review the cases for the day and to look at any outpatient cases that may have arrived for evaluation. Now, the echo lab um, in Benghazi is um, a place where pediatric cardiologists from all over Benghazi come and participate. They bring their cases from other hospitals around the city. We review those cases with them. We decide whether those children should have surgery now or whether they can wait till the next trip. We'll actually pick the children based upon the findings from the echo, CTs, any other diagnostic studies that we have. Children will be chosen during the course of our echo sessions every day. We have an anesthesia trainee, Mohammed Fadil. He's working on both sides of the country. And this is our NCA staff anesthesiologist, one of our two. His name is Archie. He's from Belarus. They're going to prep the child for surgery. And the scrub nurse, who in this case is Ms. Martina Pavanich, uh, is going to organize the operating room, sterile instruments. And when everything is all set, they will actually call the surgeons to come to the operating room. We have three lead surgeons on our team. Myself. Dr. Vitaly Dudovich, who's actually a Belarusian that I trained for 12 years at the National Cardiac Center in Minsk, Belarus. And Dr. Marcella Cardarelli, who is from the Innova Hospital in Fairfax, Virginia. Now, all three of us have made trips to both sides of Libya and operated on children in both operating rooms. The operations are varied in their nature and their scope and their complexity. And the operation that you're about to see was a restality that we performed on a child there in Big Dots. So this is a CT angio of this child who has um, transposition pulmonary atresia VSD. This ductus is in a bit of an unusual place and then it comes off um, and goes to the right pulmonary artery just above the bifurcation of the um, upper and lower lobe arteries. So everybody was a little bit confused about what that structure was, what that vascular structure was, because it's headed in a bizarre direction. Everybody's confirmed it now to be the ductus. What, do you got a hole in the line? No, 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 it was in the drain. You got more coming back in the left atrium than you do in anything else. Okay. Closing the uh, pulmonary artery stump, which has actually <clears throat> got no lumen in it. The other thing that you look for is you look to make sure that there's no fibrous ridge on the VSD, because if there is, it's restrictive and you need to be make it bigger. Okay, Dr. Vitaly tying. 
Rubber shot. Like all cardiac surgeons, we all depend upon our perfusionists, and we're blessed to have two exceptional perfusionists. The perfusionist on this trip is Freshemir. Fresho is from Croatia, from the Rebro University Hospital. I worked with Fresho from 1993 to 2004, and he has really turned out to be a superb pediatric perfusionist. The following operation, the children are taken to the intensive care unit and handover is performed. And this is a time where both nurses from the United States or other countries that have volunteered to come and work with us work directly with their Libyan counterparts. One of the things that we value is providing an opportunity for our parents to see their children as soon as possible after the child has been stabilized and handover has been completed. We'll let the parents come in and see how their child is at that time. We think this is a very important time for the parents. They can relieve themselves of all the anxiety that they've had leading up to this heart surgery. Whether it's developing an operation that makes operating on children with VSD, high pulmonary vascular resistance, and pulmonary hypertension, low risk, or whether it's trying to reconstruct a right ventricular outflow tract with pulmonary artery confluence utilizing autologous pericardium, or xenopericardium, or core matrix in some cases. You've got to be innovative and use your ingenuity sometimes to solve these problems in the operating room. So let me tell you a little bit about our work uh, in Libya in terms of case volume, uh, what we've actually been able to accomplish over the years. We began in 2012, and as you can see from this graph, we operated at one site, the blue, Benghazi and the green is cumulative. I think we operated on 68 children that year. In 2013, we actually operated on 77 children. Our program in Benghazi in 2014 was interrupted by the start of the Civil War. General Hafter decided at that time that he was going to drive the Islamists out of Benghazi. And our hospital was literally in the middle of the war between the Islamists and the Libyan National Army. That's the purpose of the boom. But in 2019, our Tripoli program numbers decreased substantially as a result of the Libyan National Army deciding to take the war to Tripoli to try and take over the government. We were able to make trips both into Benghazi and Tobruk because things were quiet on that side of the country. We operated on about 150 children. In 2020, unfortunately, the COVID pandemic settled around the world. We were fortunate that we had two trips to Libya scheduled early in the year. And before the Libyan borders were closed, we were actually able to operate on a grand total of about 77 children. So let me give an example of the overall work that we've been able to perform in Libya. 2012, slightly less than 100 children. 2013, slightly more than 100 children. The additional children that we were able to operate on the first two trips in 2020 have pushed us to almost 1,000. We are 42 operations short of 1,000 children operated in Bolivia since the beginning of our program in 2012. Yeah, we've all been affected uh, in a major way by the COVID-19 pandemic, but perhaps nobody has been affected more seriously than the children of the world in low and middle income countries who have congenital heart disease, or rheumatic heart disease for that matter. Those children's lives have been put at risk by COVID-19, and some of those children are gonna die. And that's gonna be collateral damage caused by COVID-19. Fortunately, we were able to get a few trips in before all of the countries locked down their borders. We made trips to Benghazi, Kimarovo, and Tripoli operating on almost 100 patients before we canceled our next six trips in a row that were from the early March until early June. We're ready to resume our work as soon as the countries reopen. We need volunteers at most every level to assist us once the world is open. It is our hope that we can continue to count on the generosity of the medical product community 
contribute to the support of our work and that of others involved in developing pediatric cardiac surgery in low and middle income countries. We welcome all of you, volunteers and medical product companies, to assist us and join us in our efforts for the children of the world in low and middle income countries with congenital heart disease. They really deserve our help. Thank you and goodbye.